good morning once again, and uh, welcome to Fresh Vision uh, Calvary Chapel uh, here in El Paso, Texas, Far West Texas. And if you're watching via the live stream or even here in person, you want more information about uh, Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, I would invite you to visit our website at um, fvccelp.com. Um, and uh, we'll get that pulled up in just a second here. But if you go to our website, there is just a lot of information about the church. You want to learn more about uh, Pastor Angel and his family. We have a short biography about him on there. And um, I would direct you to our site menu, which is at the top of the um, website. And we'll get that pulled up in just a second. If you're doing it on the phone, like via the app, um, there's, a, there's three bars that you'll click on. But here, if you're doing it on your, on your desktop or on your laptop, it'll be the site menu that you're going to want to go to. And if you click on that site menu, it'll give you a nice uh, like table of contents of the website, and you can visit uh, different parts of the website there. One area that I do want to direct you guys to is our media site. And if you go there, it'll take you to all of our different platforms where we have all of our past and current studies. And um, we have them on YouTube. We have them on iTunes Podcast, SoundCloud. And um, they're free of charge. We encourage you guys to listen and also to share those on your own personal social media platforms. You know, right now we want to spread the gospel by sharing those messages. And when you think about social media, they're not, people are not really using it for God's glory right now. And we want to use it to channel the gospel message. So if you go back to that site menu, let's say you want to get in contact with us during the week or you just want to reach out to the church. If you click on that site menu, go down to contact us. It'll take you to the middle portion of the website there. If you notice before I, I mentioned the comments here, there is also some links to our Facebook, our Twitter accounts, our, I, our um, not iTunes, but our Instagram, and then as well as our YouTube channel. And we do want to encourage you all to subscribe. Once again, it's not about having likes, but rather it's about Jesus Christ. We want to encourage you all to share the love of Jesus Christ through the messages that we have here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. And, um, you know, it's not a fresh, Calvary, fresh Vision Calvary Chapel thing, but it's a Jesus thing. That's our heart here at this church. Now, if you go down here to contact us, um, this is kind of like an electronic version of, of this uh, postcard here. So you can reach out to us here, any prayer requests, anything like that, and uh, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And I think if you go a little bit further down, um, we also have our physical meeting address if you're interested in um, inviting someone or you just don't know where the church is, there is our physical uh, meeting address, also our email address so that you can get in contact with us and then our phone number as well. And um, we don't have a formal offering here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. However, as uh, the Lord's leading you to give, we do have the agape box, which is in the back of the room. And then if you do want to give electronically, you can do that at the very bottom of the website. If you click on the online giving, and there's a link there through PayPal. And that's actually linked to all of our social media sites as well. So if you're watching there uh, via the live stream, you'll see that below the video description. And once again, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. That's between you and the Lord. We're not going to force you. We're not going to push you to give. That's between you and the Lord. But I will tell you, all the gifts and everything that is donated to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel is used solely for the purposes of pointing people uh, to Jesus. So going back to the home menu, um, once again, if you visit the website, uh, all the information is on there, and you, you can uh, visit that if you guys have a little bit of time uh, today. And uh, just some general announcements. On Wednesdays, the men are gathering here at the church at 6.30 in the evening, and uh, we're currently going through the book of Genesis. And um, we're also having food, so we're sharing a meal together, having a time of fellowship, and also a time in the Word. So if you're interested, uh, please come by 6.30 here at the church on Wednesday evenings. Or um, if you want more information, you can contact the church and we can give you that information as well. We also have a youth ministry, middle school, high school age. Um, it's called Unashamed. And we actually meet right after announcements. We're currently going through the Gospel of Luke. And um, if you're interested in getting connected with the youth ministry, um, come check us out here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We're also planning a monthly outing. You know, we, we kind of made a list of different uh, things maybe we want to do um, before the end of August here. I know some of you all have returned to school already and kind of gone into a schedule of things, but it's important that we can continue to fellowship. So um, we're planning that event. If you um, are interested in that, you can contact the church or, or just come by. We also have children's ministry. Um, if that's keeping you from coming to church, don't let that keep you from coming to church. Bring your kids with you. 
Um, they also meet right after announcements in the back here. And um, we, we love everyone to come to church. So if you, if you bring your, your small children with you, there will be a place for them uh, here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. And um, I think that is the extent of the announcements for this morning. So uh, I'll go ahead and pass this over to Pastor Angel. So today we continue in our study of 2 Samuel. And we'll be in chapter 13. And I've titled today's message, The Evil Act of a Brother. Now, before I begin, it's important for me to, to, to state this. Uh, today we're going to be covering a really sensitive subject um, that um, maybe a lot of uh, women have been affected by this. So I will, as I prepare this message, I try to be as sensitive as possible, but also I want to stay true to the word. I want to stay true to the, the, the message, the story that's going on here. Um, but uh, if, again, if it seems to too sensitive for you, um, feel free to come back at a later time, visit, revisit this story, but I honestly really believe this here, this message, this story, uh, the Lord wants to speak to, to you. There may be someone out there that, that really needs to hear this. Um, so um, I just want to make everyone aware of that before I begin. Now, we've seen in the first 10 chapters of this book, how God empowered David to defeat Israel's enemies and establish and expand the kingdom. Then David commits adultery, murder, and deception. And then the rest of 2 Samuel described David wrestling with problems caused by his own children. His days are dark. And disappointing. But he still, in spite of all that, depends on the Lord. And the Lord enables him to overcome and the nations, uh, to overcome um, and prepare the nations for the reign of his son Solomon. See, what life does to us depends on what life finds in us. And in David, was a muscular faith, a muscular faith in the living God. But nevertheless, even as David was reigning over Israel, sin and death were reigning over his own family. Yes, God had absolutely forgiven David for his sins, but David was now discovering or will be discovering that the the consequences of forgiven sin is very painful. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 5 says that God had blessed David with, with many sons. But Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says that the Lord would turn those blessings into, curse, into curses. And so for the next couple of weeks, we're going to see some of these events unfold like a tragic symphony. This week, as we get into chapter 13, we'll be reading about four of them. From love to lust, from lust to hatred, from hatred to murder, and from murder to exile. And then next week, when we get to chapter 14, we'll be covering the final act of this entire event. How Absalom went from exile to reconciliation. So then, chapters 13 and 14 are in fact a story of how this son, Absalom, is banished in anger and restor- restored in mercy. So before we get into God's word today, let's pray and ask for him to speak to us this morning. Lord God, thank you that you've Again, given us another wonderful, beautiful day. Even in, in this wet morning, El Paso morning, Lord, we know that um, you've this this rain is your creation, and it's wonderful. It's beautiful. It can be messy, Lord, but um, again, we we're just so thankful that you've created it all for us, Lord. 
So now as we get into your word this morning, I pray that you will bless it, Lord. I pray that you will speak to us powerfully. I pray that you will speak to the hearts and minds of those that are here, those that are watching, Lord, and plant that seed that will eventually grow into a beautiful, fruitful tree, Lord. So now, again, fill this room, Lord, and keep us safe and and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Second Samuel, chapter 13. And the Word of God says, Some time passed. David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar. And David's son Amnon was infatuated with her. Amnon was, was frustrated to the point of making himself sick over his sister Tamar because she was a virgin. But it seemed impossible to do anything to her. Amnon, Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, a son of David's brother Shemel. Jonadab was a very shrewd man, and he asked Amnon, why are you the, why are you, the king's son, so miserable every morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon replied, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend you're sick. When your, when your father comes to see you, say to him, please let my sister Tamar come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare a meal in my presence so I can watch and eat from her hand. So Amnon laid down and pretended to be sick. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, Please let my sister Tamar come and make me a couple of cakes in my presence so I can eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace, Please go to your brother, brother Amnon's house and prepare a meal for him. When Tamar went to his house, then Tamar went to his house while Amnon was laying down. She took dough, kneaded it, made cakes in his presence, and baked them. She brought the pan and set it down in front of him, but he refused to eat. Amnon said, everyone leave me, and everyone left him. Bring the meal to the bedroom, Amnon told Tamar, so I can eat from your hand. Tamar took the cakes she had made and went to her brother Amnon's bedroom. When she brought them to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come, sleep with me, my sister. Don't, brother, she cried. Don't disgrace me, for such a thing would never be done in Israel. Don't commit this outrage. Where could I ever go with my humiliation? And you, you would be like one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Please speak to the king, for he won't keep me from you. But he refused to listen to her. And because he was stronger than she was, he disgraced her by raping her. So Amnon hated Tamar with such intensity that, he, that the hatred he hated her with was greater than the love he had loved her with. Get out of here, he said. No, she cried. Sending me away is much worse than the great wrong you've already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. Instead, he called the servants who waited on him. Get this away from me. Throw her out and bolt the door behind her. Amnon's ser servant threw her out and bolted the door behind her. Uh, Tamar was wearing a long-sleeved garment because this was the king's virgin's daughter. This is what the king's virgin's daughters wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long-sleeved garment she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went away crying out. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has your brother Amnon been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take, the, don't take this thing to heart. So Tamar lived as a desolate woman in the house of her brother Absalom. When King David heard about all these things, he was furious. Absalom didn't say anything to Amnon, either good or bad, because he hated Amnon since he disgraced his sister Tamar. Two years later, Absalom's sheep shearers were at Baal Hazor near Ephraim, 
and Absalom invited the king's sons. Then he went to the king and said, Your servant has just hired sheep shearers. Will the king and his servants please come with your servant? The king replied to Absalom, No, my son, we should not all go or we will be a burden to you. Although Absalom urged him, he wasn't willing to go, though he did bless him. If not, Absalom said, please let my brother Amnon go with us. The king asked him, why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him. So he sent Amnon and all the king's sons. Now Absalom commanded his young men, watch Amnon until he is in a good mood from the wine. When I order you to strike Amnon, then kill him. Don't be afraid. Am I not the one who has commanded you? Be strong and valiant. So Absalom's young men did to Amnon just as Absalom had commanded. Then all the rest of the king's sons got up and each fled on his mule. While they were on the way, a report reached David. Absalom has struck down all the king's sons. Not even one of them survived. In response, in response, the king stood up, tore his clothes, and lay down on the ground. And all of his servants stood by with their clothes torn. But Jonadab, son of David's brother Shimea, spoke up, my lord, my lord must not think they have killed all the young men, the king's sons, because only Amnon is dead. In fact, Absalom has planned this ever since the day Amnon disgraced his sister Tamar. So now, my lord, the king, don't take seriously the report that says all the king's sons are dead. Only Amnon is dead. Meanwhile, Absalom had fled. When the young man, when the young man who was standing watch looked up, there were many people coming from the road west of him, from the, from the side of the mountain. Jonadab said to the king, Look, the king's sons have come. It's exactly like your servant said. Just as he's finished speaking, the king's son, sons entered and wept loudly. Then the king and all his servants also wept very bitterly. But Absalom fled and went to Tamai, Talma, Talmai, son of Amihud, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. After Absalom had fled to Geshur and had been there three years, King David longed to go to Absalom, for David had finished grieving over Amnon's death. Back in verse 10 of the previous chapter, the prophet Nathan had told David that because of his affair with Bathsheba, the sword would never depart from his house. And so, well, just as we read, David is now seeing these prophetic words become real when he began to experience the heartbreaks of rape and murder within his own family. In the first 14 verses of here, we're told how the love of one of David's sons turned into lust. But before he's actually mentioned by name, the story first mentions another son named Absalom. Why is that? Because for the next several chapters, the focus will be on him. And then we're then told about that, that he had a beautiful sister named Tamar. Now, just to clarify any confusion here, both Tamar and Absalom shared the same mother. So that essentially, that made them full-blooded brother and sister. And so once this is established, the next character mentioned is Amnon, another one of David's sons. He actually was, the, was David's second oldest son and the apparent heir to the throne. Now, we're not told anymore about the firstborn son. He kind of just disappears from the picture. He's not mentioned at all anymore. But here again, he's, a, he's David's second oldest son and is in line to be the next king of Israel. Now, because they had, he had a different uh, mother than Absalom and Tamar, this made him their half-brother. Again, half-brother. 
it's important to know, keep in the back of your mind as we go through the story. The story then quickly gets to the point by telling us that Amnon became so infatuated with his half-sister Tamar, he thought he loved her. But despite the, his privileged status of being the heir apparent, by being a prince, heir to the throne, he finds himself powerless to possess her, which frustrates him so much that it makes him physically sick. Now, why couldn't he have her? Well, there are two main reasons. Those two main reasons were because she was a virgin and because she was his half-sister. Now, in any other circumstance, he could have just married her but because Leviticus 8 and 9 prohibited these kind of relations, he understood, he knew that marriage was, it wasn't an option. But also the fact that she was a virgin daughter of the king made it even a greater impossibility to just even have a casual sexual encounter with her. Jonadab, Amnon's friend and cousin, then comes into the picture. And he's immediately described as someone that a very, he's immediately described as a very shrewd man. And what this means is that he was basically a master manipulator. He knew how to talk to people, how to, you know, arrange circumstances so that he got what he wanted. He knew what he wanted and how to get it. So when Amnon explained his problem to his cousin, Jonadab, Jonadab basically gives him a roadmap, a plan that would enable him to fulfill his unlawful sexual desires with Tamar. He advised Amnon to pretend to be sick, lay in bed, feign an illness, and then tell your dad, tell your father to have Tamar prepare a meal, to bake some cakes, and to personally bring it to him, or personally bring it to, to Amnon. Well, John and Dub's plan was effective. Tamar is dispatched, and she obediently does what her father asks her. And she begins to bake him some cakes. She goes to his house, and, and while she's preparing and doing all these, you know, just making him a meal, he plays his devious role perfectly. See, he doesn't, he isn't really craving food. He craves intimacy. He wants to eat from her hand, but in private. So far, nothing seems to be, so far, nothing is amiss. But then in verse 11, Amnon abruptly says those three powerful and dangerous words that Potiphar's wife said to Joseph, Genesis chapter 39, verse 7, sleep with me. Now, keep in mind, Jonadab's plan only assured a private meeting with Tamar. So now everything up to this point is now all Amnon. Tamar refuses. But she also knows she can't just run away. So she tries to stop him by giving him some, making him think, by giving him some logical reasons not to go on with, with, with what he's about to do. She first reminds him that sexual relations between brother and sister should never be done in Israel. Next, she tells him that such action would be an outrage. Thirdly, she tells him she would be hum humiliated. 
regardless of where she went. She couldn't be able to go out in public without someone talking about her, someone saying something about that incident. Her reputation would be ruined. And fourthly, she tells Amnon that he would be like one of the outrageous fools in Israel's long history. And then she makes one last plea, almost as if to try to convince him that this plan, this, this will work. That if he just would talk to the king, the king would make an exception to the rule. But even after all that, Amnon refused to listen. His lust becomes so strong. His, his need to have her became so powerful that he just would not listen to reason, would not listen to the pleas of his half-sister. And it was at this point that his love for her, if it really was love, if it really was genuine, went from being that of a personal mental desire that could have easily been forgiven by God if he just would have came and, and, and asked for, for forgiveness, where he would have repented and asked for forgiveness, to now forcefully acting on that desire. So for, verse 14 makes it clear that Amnon overpowered his half-sister and disgraced her by raping her. Now, it gets worse. From verses 15 to 22, we see how Amnon's lust turns into hatred. There in verse 15, it says that after he committed this shameful act, he hated Tamar with such intensity that, he, that the hatred he hated her with was greater than the love he had loved her with. See, true love would never violate another person's body just to satisfy selfish appetites. Nor would true love try to persuade someone to disobey the law of God. In his lustful desires, Amnon confused lust with love and didn't realize that there was a fine line between selfish love and hatred. Before he sinned, he wanted to mar all to himself. And now that he had sinned, he couldn't get rid of her fast enough. Now, I want to read to you something amazing that Pastor Chuck Smith once said while teaching on this passage. He said, Let me give a friendly fatherly tip to all you young girls who may be in, in the position of Tamar in that you have some fellow who really, who is really pressing hard to have sex with you. He is the soul of he is the soul of kindness. He is very attentive. He calls all the time. He opens the door for you. He brings you flowers, but is pushing you hard for a sexual relationship. Don't give in. If you really love him, make him wait until you're married. If he really loves you, he will. Over and over, over, time and time again, the fellow will press and press until he has taken you to bed. And that's the last you see or hear from him. You're no longer a challenge. He's conquered, and he's off for new conquests. If you really love him and want to make him, and want, and want him, make him wait. If you really love God and love yourself, make him wait." Unquote. That was the father of a young girl that's coming of age, I really hope that I'll have an opportunity to share this wisdom with my daughter soon. She's at that middle school age and 
but things began to change, you know, and and th those pressures begin, as many of you probably know. And so that's this is something that I, if you're if you're a young girl, if you are watching this, that uh, you know, I hope you take this to heart. But again, I hope I'll be able to one day share this also with my own daughter. And so, back in our story, Ash, he lay in his bed now after this horrible deed has taken place. No, draw, no doubt traumatized by the violence. Amnon said four of the ugliest words that can be said to someone who's just been violated. Get out of here. Amazingly, though, Tamar refused to leave. She said no. She told him that sending her away would be worse than the rape. But once again, Tamar, uh, Amnon refused to listen to her. So he called one of his servants and told him to get her, to get rid of her and to lock the door behind her. No longer did he referred to Tamar as his sister. Now she was basically an object with a feminine pronoun. She no longer was a person, almost like, a, like an animal. And once you get bored, you just you know, get rid of. Sexual sins usually produce that kind of emotional damage. See, when you treat other people like things to be used, you end up throwing them aside like broken toys or used clothes. Tamar's sense of desolation was every bit as great as if she were mourning. So she expressed that grief in a way that could be seen and heard by everyone. She knew the word was going to get out, and she didn't want to make it seem like she was okay with it. So she needed to make sure everyone understood what she really felt. She put ashes on her head, tore that long sleeved robe that was designated for the king's virgin daughters. It must, this robe must have been just as beautiful as Joseph's robe that we read about in Genesis. She tore it up and went away crying. She put her hand on her head is a gesture that's mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 30, verse 37. But in a lot of sculptures and tomb paintings, it appears to symbolize captivity. Now it appears from verse 20 that Absalom's uh, that Absalom suspected that Amnon had done something to hurt Tamar. So he delicately or tries his best to delic delicately question her about it. Sally, though, the end of verse 20 tells us what ended up happening to her. Disgraced and unwanted for marriage. Though it wasn't her fault, Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. This probably means that she lived and died unwed. Lust, ladies and gentlemen, hurts the innocent as well as the guilty. Now when King David heard about what Amnon had done, he was furious. But here's the thing, he never did anything about it. Like Eli and Samuel, David failed effectively to control his sons. And his, and his own bad example would inhibit any protest against Amnon. Absalom, however, showed his disapproval by refusing to have anything to do with Amnon and seething with anger, waited for an opportunity to avenge 
the wrong done to his sister. You have to imagine, how would you feel? How would you react if someone you loved and cared for was violated in such a way? Well, after that lust turned into hate, verses 23 to 36, then shows us how Absalom's hatred turned into murder. Absalom patiently waited. He stood by, watching, waiting, planning, scheming for the perfect opportunity to take vengeance. And according to verse 23, that opportunity came two years later. It came about when he hosted a festival to celebrate the time of sheep shearing, which was an old custom that Israel served. Now, I don't have the time to explain what sheep shearing was. There's YouTube videos on it, so you can look that up, and it's, it's, it's interesting to watch that, watch sheep shearing. Well, he invited and urged his father, David, to join him at this festivity. But the king declined. Absalom then requested that Amnon attend in David's place, a request that the king reluctantly granted. He was suspicious. He, it sounds like he was suspicious about it, but he reluctantly granted it. And well, in the midst of the festivities, the servants of Absalom, on a prearranged signal, attacked and murdered the unsuspecting Amnon. And so during all this chaos, thinking that they were going to be next, the rest of David's sons got up, got on their donkeys, on their mules, and booked it back to Jerusalem as quickly as possible. But before they even made it there, somehow someone must have outran those mules because David got some fake news that Absalom had killed all of his sons. And this, once again, led David into a complete depression. The same kind of mourning that he had when he realized that the child that he had with Bathsheba had died. However, Jonadab, Jonadab reappears back into the story and tells the king that only Amnon's dead. Now, how he knew, again, he was a shrewd man. He knew what was, probably had some birds, or some crows or something, give, give him the news, I don't know, but he knew this information. And that Absalom had plotted his death since the day that Tamar was violated. And this report was later verified by a watchman who saw those princes enter the city, enter those gates, enter the palace, and weeping loudly. Now, in case you didn't know, one of the biggest issues with revenge is that, is that it doesn't really solve any problems. And it eventually turns around and hurts that person seeking revenge. Francis Bacon once wrote, In taking revenge, a man, is, a man is but even with his enemy, but in passing it over, he is superior. If you think about it, no one was treated more unjustly and inhumanely than Jesus Christ at his trial and his execution. The way he was treated, the way he was delivered, the way he was hung on that cross was the worst possible way that a human could be treated, much less be given the death penalty. Yet, he didn't retaliate. And now because of this, because of what he did, we as Christians, as believers, can now look to him as a perfect example of how we should handle things, how we should handle it when we or someone we love is wronged. 
the old slogan, don't get mad, get even, may satisfy some people, may satisfy those in the world, those who don't know the Lord. But it's not something the Lord will ever be pleased with. Our way, the Christian way, is the way of forgiveness and faith. Trusting the Lord to work everything out for our good and His glory. In 2005, a pastor in Tulsa, Oklahoma, had an opportunity to practice what he had been teaching on. See, that pastor was preaching on forgiveness. When a man came up and punched him in the face, and then afterwards he just continued with the sermon, even though the blow had opened a cut above his eye that would require two stitches. Church members subdued the attacker, and police arrested him. Sometime during the church service, the, the pastor, the church prayed for his assailant, and he declined to press charges. This pastor here, would, he had an opportunity to practice what he was particularly teaching on, and so he wanted to set again the example, and Jesus was his example as well. Okay, so now in the final three verses of chapter 13, we're told how murder turned into exile. There it says that Absalom fled for his life to Geshur in Syria, where his mother had lived, and where Talmai, his maternal grandfather, was king. And there he lived for three years. Now since Amnon was older than Absalom, he was supposed to be the next in line to the throne but now that Amnon was dead, it's possible that Absalom may have begun to have visions of himself now on the throne. Now this is only speculation. But what we do know for certain is that King David longed to see Absalom again after his grief with Amnon's death had subsided. And next week, when we get to chapter 14, we're going to see how his exile turned into reconciliation. But here's the thing. His love and his sense for justice made that reconciliation difficult. And because of this, he was torn between the two. And he did nothing. It's significant, perhaps, that David, who rightly refrained from taking action against Saul in his younger days, became blameworthy as king for failing to execute justice within his own family. One reason had to do with his own failings, which he could see being reproduced now in his sons. Another arose out of his love for his sons, who nevertheless had no shame about deceiving their father into doing what they wanted and involving him in, his evil, in their evil plans. So as you can see, the prophecy of Nathan that the sword would never depart from his house was beginning, was now working out in David's experience. Now, before I conclude, let me suggest some of the ways this passage may instruct us. First, this text is placed immediately following the passage that depicts David's sin, its personal consequences in the death of his first son by Bathsheba. It isn't only because the events of chapter 13 follow closely in time to those of chapter 12, but because chapter 13 describes further consequences of David's sin. See, David's, see the sin of David that was once personal and private? comes to, to impact the entire nation. David's sin affects him, his wife and son, and now other members of his family. Soon, David's sin will divide the nation and deprive David of his throne for, for a time. 
I believe it's, it's, it's certainly true that the death of David's son in chapter 12 and now the rape of his daughter and the murder of his son are not God's punishment for his sin, but rather God's discipline. See, if David were to be punished for his son, for his sin, he would have to die. But Nathan assured David that he wouldn't die because his sins had been taken away. The tragedies that which take place from this point on are meant to be instructive and corrective, even though they're also painful. This is completely consistent with what it says in the first 13 verses of Hebrews chapter 12. I also believe that God orchestrated these events to enable David to experience his own sin from the perspective of others. In effect, some of David's family were doing what David had done to God. As David abused his authority as the king of Israel to sin against God by taking Bathsheba, Amnon now abuses his authority and position as son of the king to take Tamar. As David sinned in killing Uriah, Absalom sinned by killing Amnon. David can now experience what God did, what Bathsheba did, what others impacted by his sin did. Second, this text has, this text has much to teach David and us regarding sin. Notice that sin starts with some kind of forbidden fruit. For Adam and Eve, the forbidden fruit was eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For Joseph, it was Potiphar's wife. For Daniel and his three friends, it was the king's foods. For David, it was Bathsheba. For Amnon, it was Tamar. We see that while sin starts small and often private, it grows quickly to greater and more public sin. We see from our text that sin never pays. Its price tag is always much greater and much higher than it's worth. Neither David nor his family nor the nation of Israel would smile about David's sin and its consequences. As Mark Twain once said, it's better to stay out and to get out. This certainly applies to sin, ladies and gentlemen. This passage certainly encourages us to stay out of sin, but also instructs us that once sin has begun, the sooner it's stopped, the better for all. How much better for all if the shrewd Jonadab had rebuked Amnon for his sinful lust, rather than to tell him how he could get what he wanted. How much better if David had recognized the evil of Amnon's request and refused to allow his daughter to see Amnon and his son Amnon to go to uh, that sheep shearing event of Absalom. There is a passivity here towards the sin of others, which is painfully evident. Those who will not correct those who sin are only co-conspirators in their expanding sin. How many families have experienced great heart heartache because a mother or a father refused to discipline a willful or wayful, wayward child? How many marriages have broken up because a husband or wife refused to deal with the sin in their lives? or in the life of their mate. If you're not dealing with these issues, these things that are happening in your marriages that just is better not to be spoken about, then it's, it's just bubbling up. Eventually it's gonna blow over. Talk them over, deal with them, have a serious conversation about these things. 
forgive and allow yourself to be forgiven. How often also have families taken cor- the course of action Absalom recommended, keeping sin a family secret. We certainly see that sin separates. We know or should know that sin separates us from God, but it also separates us from others. The sin of Adam and Eve brought separation from God, and shortly after it separated Cain and Abel. Sin separated Joseph and his brothers. Sin divided David's family. Sin separated Amnon and Tamar. Amnon and Absalom. David and Absalom. And eventually the whole nation. See, church, sin is a root of disunity and division. Thirdly, we can learn from each of the characters in our text. Amnon warns us about the painful pursuits of fleshly lusts. Jonadab Jonadab warns us about the danger of using the sin of others to further our own interests, making them a part of our own agenda, rather than paying the price for rebuke and correction. David instructs us concerning passivity towards sin. David knew all the facts about the crime committed against his daughter, yet it seems that he did nothing about it. Why not? Was it his own guilt due to his own sin with Bathsheba? Was he afraid that if he corrected Amnon, someone might call him out and ask him, who was he? And did he have a right to cast stones at other sinners? Whatever the reason for David's inaction, it only facilitated the sins of others. And from Absalom, we learn the danger of resentment and bitterness. Absalom was not willing to deal with Amnon biblically. All he wanted about, for those two years, all he wanted was revenge in his own way. And this he did. And in doing so, he became a a murderer and a fugitive. Fourth, this text has much to say about love. Everything that is called love is not necessarily love. It's obvious that Amnon thinks he's in love, but it's also obvious that he's not. In Amnon's mind, love is synonymous with sex. His brand of love is frustrated by purity and not at all concerned about righteousness. Amnon's love would not stand the test of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Tamar was never fooled by Amnon on this matter. I think so many young women have forsaken their virginity because of a few kind and attentive words uttered by a hormone-driven young man. Today, there are many young women who fail to hold the same values or the same standard as Tamar. They don't see their sexual purity as something to be prized and protected. They see it as a curse. They see it as a a chain, a ball and chain that they have to drag around with them in their schools, in their workplaces, wherever they're at. They're ashamed to say that I'm a virgin. And a lot of them are just talking about getting rid of that virginity as soon as possible. Let this passage instruct us as men, women, as leaders, as mentors, as as parents on the real meaning of love. 
and to show them, show these young men and women the great value of sexual purity. Again, whether it's a man's or a woman's. Form them that it's okay. There's nothing wrong with waiting until you get married. Finally, this text sheds light on the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Earlier I mentioned, if you put yourself on Absalom's feet or in Absalom's shoes upon hearing that someone you loved was violated, was treated shamefully, was abused. Think about how he felt when he heard about that his uh, sister Tamar had been raped. Think about how David felt about the abuse of his daughter. One can only wonder how David found it possible not to do something to Amnon. Now with this in mind, think about how God the Father must have felt and continues to feel towards those who reject, rebel against, and blaspheme His sinless Son, Jesus Christ. When He sent His Son to the world nearly 2,000 years ago, men rejected Him as a sinner and they crucified Him on the cross of Calvary. Uh, Again, I'm just asking you to imagine here, but if you were God, how would you feel towards those who did this? And towards those who continue at this very moment to reject Christ. Well, I have some good news and some bad news for you. And let me start with the bad news. The bad news is that God is going to punish those who rejected His Son. When He returns to earth, He will come in glory and with power to subdue His enemies. Jesus said this to the high priest in Matthew chapter 26, verse 64. You have said it, Jesus told him, but I tell you, in the future you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. And so when he comes, will he find you ready? Well, regardless, everyone's going to bow down. And they're going to have to be, be, they're going to be held accountable for everything and God's going to judge him and they're going to be sent to the lake of fire where there is no relief just complete pain suffering complete absence of God but the good news of the gospel is that we don't need to suffer the wrath of God for our sin you don't need to suffer any of that Jesus Christ has already borne, He's already taken the penalty of all our sins. He's already taken it all, and all you have to do is receive Him. All you have to do is accept Him as your Lord and Savior. And so now, again, as I now close, I want to ask those who are watching, listening to this live or the recording later on, where are you at? Have you acknowledged him have you received him have you allowed him to be the personal your personal lord and savior if you haven't and you are ready to do that i want to lead you to a prayer to do that with all sincerity i want you to pour out your heart to the lord and pray this Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I now have come to believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now repent from my sins and turn away from them and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. 
thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And now I ask you to fill me to the brim with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me, teach me, show me what it is to be a born-again believer. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, welcome to the family of God. And I want to ask you to reach, reach out to us. Let us know that you prayed that prayer and we want to maybe lead you into your next steps. Um, have a conversation with you and see how we can maybe help, maybe help you find a church wherever you're at. And maybe if you're here in the area, and invite you to come check us out here in, in Northeast El Paso on the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway South. But know this, you are a born-again believer. There's a celebration in heaven going on right now because of that. And now it's just a matter of, of walking with him, allowing, allowing God to, to shape your life and to give you, so he can give you a fresh vision of yourself, of this world, and of those around you. So thank you for joining us. Have a great week. God bless you. Goodbye and farewell.